Hello, welcome back to our series on successors. We intended to do this, I guess, Tuesday, but it's taken a bit longer than that to. Uh, it's tiresome time on vacation. Yeah, uh, and it's been we had you know it's the last kind of day of nice weather, and so on. it's going to be rainier uh, in the next few days. So, um, anyways, we are going to resume the series. Again, the parameters have been no current or existing characters. Now that one is. A bit ambiguous, so I'm gonna throw in an idea at the end, or maybe two, that are featuring characters that have appeared but are but are dead now. So they're not current, and they're not existing in a sense that they're alive. So, but it's a bit unclear. Uh, besides that, um, you know, no Robert's Rebellion, but we're gonna discuss Robert's Rebellion anyways. Uh, <laughs> uh, no Duncan Egg, things like that. And these are just going to be, this section is just going to be about stories in Westeros. It's not going to be stories set elsewhere. We're also going to discuss some ideas that kind of have been floated to us or we thought about, but which I think for sure HBO isn't too interested in. Uh, I could be wrong, but I, I, I think we can say that. Uh, so we will start. Let's talk first about some of the ones that we're not going to discuss for various reasons, because I want to start it with chronologically going as far back as possible and then but i don't think we're going to see anything pre targaryen no i find that difficult it's uh yes it's very open uh people could do just about anything with it really i mean if you're gonna do age of uh, heroes a, yeah the south of seven kingdoms originally but and, it's yeah. uh it's also quite nebulous and trying to uh, it, it's such the the strokes are really broad and yeah. I don't know that they would feel that there's enough of Game of Thrones in it. It could be they any could. fantasy. They haven't done enough to talk about. Yes, they've had the uh, the various DVD extras and such talking about the arrival of the First Men and the coming of the Andals and so on. But to do these mm. legendary things, I mean, for one thing, that's the sort of thing that in any setting doesn't seem to be interesting for TV. Um, you might as well have been doing shows about, you know, Greek mythology, uh, Celtic mythology, and and that doesn't seem to have attracted anyone to no. do those sort of stories. A little too... Um, and there's also a practical aspect. Yeah. Uh, uh, if you go far back enough in time, if they want to say, oh, I want to do a story about the first men and the children of the forest, they say, oh, okay, so all these sets we built, we can't reuse them because these things didn't exist. And the costuming, like, yeah, okay, we could ask people to just bend this belief and belief, but costuming or clothing has not changed at all in thousands of years but for the most part I always say no no it doesn't make any sense no. we have to change it so I think part of it will be a practical aspect they're going to want to reuse uh, assets from Game of Thrones they're going to want yeah. to use some costumes they're going to use some sets I fully expect some of the sets to be uh, packed away rather than destroyed um, particularly King well, yeah, the Red also, Keep and some of the others. Yeah, I was thinking using locations that they've already established relationships with. Yeah. So uh, filming at, yes, they've tried to spread it out. For example, in Spain, they've used a lot of different castles, but still being able to reuse some of the locations and establish a, a consistent look is probably going to be important. And on the other hand, I think uh, an idea some of you know, you know, Tales of Night's Watch or just focus on them. Like, yes, you could see a story. You could see a band of brothers type mm -hmm. of story about men in, in difficult conditions. But I think for the successor, the first successor show, HBO is going to want to stick a bit to the formula. And the formula that has made Game of Thrones successful is, you know, we've talked about the politics, sex, violence. <laughs> women have had significant roles. Um, it's made, it's part of the reason why it has such a broad appeal. Same with the novels. Women play significant roles. And also a mix of characters. And a mix of characters, not just... In different just, situations. Yeah. The night, uh, you can see the Night's Watch and Wildlings and, you know, but it's just, it just feels too different. I think they're going to want something that has something of a similar milieu to, um, to the novels and, and to the TV show. Uh, so with that, let's start with the First one we really want to discuss was Aegon's Conquest, which I'm really a bit dubious about, but we'll... Uh, the idea behind Aegon's Conquest, well, that's, that's a pretty obvious lead-in to have, because you have Aegon and his three sisters, you have their great dragons, you have 
Horus Baratheon uh, to a lesser degree. But and all of this, you know, when they arrive, maybe starting off with them on on Dragonstone, obviously, and then looking at the various how they sort of are established there, and then you can look at the various courts in what's going to be the you know the United Seven Kingdoms and seeing what they're doing prior to being invaded. Uh, so it's um, it definitely has a lot of elements that you'll recognize. Uh, it has characters that have been mentioned, at least some of them. Um, we've seen the skulls of the dragons even. So uh, there are connections there and it does feel like something that a writer could pitch to HBO. You know, why don't we go back to the beginning, back to the founding of the Seven Kingdoms and see how all of this started. I mean, you could connect stuff like, uh, I know Danny's around a dragonstone in the show. So in their teasers leading up to this, they could take clips of her arriving on Dragonstone and then do a, a, a zoom and then suddenly it's Aegon preparing to leave Dragonstone and kind of tease it that way and then you also uh, show his dragons and show how much bigger they are compared to Daenerys's. I think um, they might be starting to run into problems with just how big a dragon they can Yeah, they have a very tiny, tiny little rider on top of a dragon. Yeah. But, um, with armor and... Harness, thank you. Yes. Um, so you can see it, and you've got the, the like, you, you have three main characters, Aegon and his sisters, and obviously you got to deal with the fact that it's an incestuous, not at all kind of thing going on. Uh, you got Oris Baratheon, the other major figure. Uh, the World of Ice and Fire, the account of Aegon's conquest, which is 100% George's, un basically unedited, other than any corrections, but pure text. Um, describes the various courts, the courts of the veil and, and so on. And you would have the initial, I think, my problem with it is it's almost a little episodic in that you have these distinct campaigns, sort of one kingdom after another falls, and it feels like, are you just going to go like each season, it's going to be a different kingdom? Um, it, and, and are you... It just feels strange to me, the structure of it. Like, it would be awesome to see Argolac, the Arrogant, and the Last Storm. Um, it'd be awesome to see... The Field of Fire. The Field of Fire. <laughs> it'd be awesome to see Heron Hall oh. before it was burned. But... And being toasted. But, but there's a lot of battles, a lot of conflict. <laughs> like, but you have to show because your main characters are involved in all of them. Uh, some of the things... Later, I will discuss the primary characters aren't actually necessarily involved in the big fights. True. So you can kind of have them more easily mm -hmm. off screen in a way that feels reasonable and effective. I know I've heard a lot of people wondering about what happened. Uh, I guess it was the last episode with some battle that should have happened that doesn't happen. Or mm -hmm. I, when I saw all yeah. people complaining that Benioff off and Weiser say, "Oh, the materials." Aren't known as great fighters, so why do we? Well, why would we wouldn't bother showing a battle because it'd be a rout. Because you know th there are no terrible fighters and no Leo Longhorn and the Knight of Flowers no, and no, the no, fact no. that they held no, no. the largest. They're kingdom, gardeners. That then the largest kingdom that you know. No, but they're gardeners outside of the north. They grow roses there. Yeah, I don't know. It's it sounds it sounds it sounds like a production thing that they tried to justify as you know with a silly bit of. Anyways, I I, I don't it'd watch, be, so why do I care? It would be hard to do those sort of cop outs. When you're doing Aegon's conquest, when Aegon is personally like, burning Harren Hall, when yes. uh, when uh, I think it was Rhaenys and Oris are personally fighting the last storm. Mm. Um, now Visenya, Visenya, well that that's okay because it's not really okay. fighting. So Visenya, you know, dealing with the veil that that works pretty well as well. Mm. Although there's a whole thing where she burns the whole fleet, and that's another. So there's yeah. a lot of things where you kind of feel like you've got to show it and. And I think that goes beyond the budget that they're going to have for a show like this. I think I and I, I'm more bothered by the structure. How do you structure it when you have all of these different kings and their distinct courts? Like, how do you dramatize something where you have so few characters? You have Arlac, you have his mm. da daughter Argella, and then you've got Heron and his sons. Maybe I guess you'd have to focus on one or two of them, sort of their fates when the Targaryens showed up. And make the others less significant? Yeah, I'm but, I mean, more, but it's difficult. Who do you... It really is you, tough. What do you decide on? 
And as I you still have to flesh out characters there and you only have sort of the main players in each court. Yeah. And if you want to make it a fully fleshed out story about what is happening to these people, obviously you still have to do that with the, the Targaryens. I mean, there's got to be peop- more people around. It's not just Aegon and Visenya and Rhaenys. They have to have a whole you know, court around them on Dragonstone. But yeah. in the account, it comes across a little bit that they're sitting there alone on Dragonstone. Yeah. Th- th- there is, so and because, they because it is a historical narrative, we don't see... So that is true for all of the courts that we would need more. Yeah, they, I mean, and that's great for writers. They can have room to create stuff. But at the same time, like, how much do you have to create? You can't really yeah. show all these courts fully fleshed out when the focus is really on the Targaryens, so yeah, I I I think I vaguely recall. Or you just recall... go with Targaryen and Stark, but then you kind of skip the battles because Thor and Stark I is the king who knelt. I think the show Vikings <laughs> has kind of did that when Linus Roach's character was introduced. I, I stopped. I love him. He's a fantastic actor, but I think I stopped with that season. Um, then the show was not for me. That's but... when they introduced the slutty princess. Yeah, that was part of it. Yeah. But anyways, I think, as I recall, they arrive in England and they have an initial conflict with his king. Yeah. And then you see that behind him, there's a more significant king that they're going to have to deal with. And that's like towards the end of that season. And then the next season, I think, follows them more. I think that's my recollection. So you kind of do a thing where you start with, you acknowledge there's all these kings. They have this goal of all the kingdoms. They, You can have brief glimpses of some of the kingdoms, but you focus on... The Stormlands and the, and the Riverlands to begin with, maybe. And then you go into the Reach and the Westerlands. Because I think if you want people to be invested, you kind of have to show these kingdoms before they're being conquered. Yeah. And then, because if you want the sort of... Um, you know, who's people going to be rooting for? Are they going to be rooting for the Targaryens to, um, you know, take over? Or yeah. is it? are they going to be more allied with the existing kingdoms? Uh, and to have any hope of getting people to have that sort of split uh, loyalties, yeah. you have to invest time in those kingdoms first. Yeah, I, I just find it very tough to structure in my head, but um, maybe, maybe. Yeah. And also the cost. The cost yeah, I think, I think the think cost the... is... I think you could structure it. You'd have to simplify some things, and um, well, that always hurts. Perfectly, yeah. Perfect I people mean, dropping some battles and... and yes. And, uh, but still, uh, the main players in the conflict are three people riding very, very large fire-breathing dragons. Yeah. And they're involved in a lot of things. So um, let's move a bit further ahead to another period that we feel like might be of interest. This next period is following after Aegon's death and his... Successor Aenys I, his eldest son, by uh, Rhaenys, and then Maegor the Cruel, Maegor I, his daughter, by, his son, by Visenya. Uh, this is uh, stuff that George wrote. He wrote The Sons of a Dragon for The Royal of Ice and Fire. We had to cut it down a lot. Um, this October, the Book of Swords will actually feature that material. Um, we don't know in what form. Yet. Well, we, we, it may be edited down a little bit. That it, but I looked at it. It's not that long. It mm. kind of just barely is a novella. So I okay. think it's probably going to be pretty much complete. All right. That's my guess. Mm. Uh, it's certainly a period. Uh, Ines was a very uh, nice guy, really. Uh, loved pageantry and music and, and so on. But he was somewhat of a weak ruler. And after Aegon dies, like there's a lot of turmoil in the Seven mm. Kingdoms. A lot of people say, okay... The dragon is dead. Let's get rid of them. There's a lot of rebellions of things. And thanks to Magor, um, in part, they deal with it. But basically, Magor ends up usurping the throne from uh, his brother's children. And things get much, much darker. Much darker. Didn't poor Anus die from a stomach ulcer or something like that? Right? Yeah. Yeah. He, he didn't really have the guts to yeah. deal with the problems. Yeah. So... It's a superbly interesting time. There's a lot of intrigue to some degree. There's a lot of turmoil. Uh, a lot of... And thanks to Mager's propensities, there's a lot of sex and violence. Uh, he, I mean, you basically have a, a bloodier, more horrific tutors, basically, under him. Because he goes through wives 
quite fast. Sometimes he's married to multiple wives at the same time. That's when he's getting desperate towards the end. He's <laughs> he's commissioning the Red Keep and he's murdering, you know, mass murdering the Masons to hide keep its secrets to himself. A lot of conflicts with the faith. A lot so of conflicts with the faith. They so you can, can have, have that sort of connection to uh, Game of Thrones. He, um, you know, they got the Sept of Baylor blown up on Game of Thrones, when he certainly has a bit of Sept destroying. It was a Sept of Remembrance, burning yeah. it down. Uh, burning it down with his dragon was much more effective, I think. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> uh, in fact, when George uh, sent Sons of a Dragon, and this is this is the early stage. He did Aegon, and then he did Sons of a Dragon. Well, when he did Aegon, and then he did a little bit of Aegon, the peace, the years of Aegon's reign. But then he did Sons of a Dragon. It's like, man, I this is this stuff is getting a bit longer than I planned, and yeah. hopefully, I mean, there's material here for a whole trilogy. Um, I'm not writing it. He's he made sure to say that I'm not writing it. But there's enough material there to write a whole trilogy of books about Aegon's offspring, basically. Um, so there's certainly a lot of interesting stuff. A, a downside is that May Gore again is was very much uh, leading from the front kind of guy. He was personally commanding and leading a lot of these battles that happened in this period, including um, using his dragon against uh, his uh, nephew and killing him. It's and you know my problem with it is the fact that. Megor is a monster. He's a genuine villain. You can you? I mean, he's not a Tony Soprano who is a bad man, right? And I, I, I mean, the, yeah, he yeah. likes it too. Or or get, a Walter you know, White. Watch those sort of shows because I get so annoyed. Like, please just kill this person and, yeah. and lock them up. So Tony Soprano and Walter White are too much for me. I can't invest in a show. Yeah. and here. You have someone who is arguably worse. even worse. I mean, yes, with you know, with something like the Tudors, I mean, Henry VIII was a unpleasant person, and certainly if you were his wife, he seems yeah. to have been bad I mean, news. But Megor is, um, it, it's like you know, a show where Joffrey or or Ramsay is on the throne, and, and what. And but they are of a central character. Yes. Like you, you, like they are of a pillar of the whole thing. It feels tough. It feels very difficult to have that. I mean, um, it's interesting. You can draw some parallels there as well. I suppose technically, uh, you could parallel Mayor to Joffrey and Senia to Cersei. Although I think that the, Mayor is obviously older when he gets the throne. Uh, so Visenya is not uh, a ruler in any way. She's much more of a, a strong power behind him. I mean, she's very important. So she's certainly you have a very important female character. Yeah. And she's a very interesting character. She's not, I would say, anywhere near as villainous as Megor. I know maybe you could focus on Visenya. Uh, well, then, then what I end up thinking of is a bit of, I mean, and, and I, it, it is surely part of George's inspiration, um, I, Claudius, mm. uh, with, um, Livia. Livia. Yes. She has, she, she has a bit of that. And yeah. if you read between the lines, she's not a nice person. No. And she she's does, not a Cersei. Well, she. Well, look. I mean, I, I don't know if you, what you remember, but I mean, it. Anus is death. Memory isn't bad. Well, Anus is death. Oh, before he dies, Visenya insists on taking care of him and telling to him. Now you could think. Well, she she knew a lot. She even apparently knew some degree yeah. of magic, and she was trying. She was trying to save, him and it just didn't work. On the other hand, once yeah. he's dead. She's damn quick to make sure that her son. Yes, I could king. also see it from the point of view of she and her brother and her sister conquered the seven kingdoms. Anus has been in the process of risking losing them, some of them, and it's for the good of the kingdom to remove this very weak king. Yeah, if she did it, uh, which I, I agree is not very unlikely. Now I'm saying that she's not a mad Targaryen. And 
somebody like Cersei, by the way, I would argue it has. No, she's, she's mad. She, she has done irrational things just to get vengeance on people. Visenya no, is no, no, ruthless no. and pro- pragmatic. Yes, no, she's, that, that, that's a fair, totally fair. Yeah. I think that's, she's going to do what's best for yeah. the kingdom, actually, is what she's yeah. thinking. So I, but uh, you know, she's very much the Ice Queen, um, even you know, Aegon. It was clear he preferred Venus. <laughs> Visenya, obviously, in some ways, seemed more of a match for him. I think they were too similar as a, a thing. Yes. Probably. Um, but anyways, I, I, I have a fondness for her. Ever since I mocked it, his depiction of her, I thought, wow, wow she's gorgeous. <laughs> and she sounds fascinating and, and so on. I mean, she's the person who insisted on the founding of the King's Guard. She, I love that story. Yeah, she personally saved Aegon's life from assassins. Mm-hmm. With You know, she was a skilled swordswoman. Uh, she, Dark Sister was her sword, actually. So uh, I could totally see that. Um, Maybe they should just make a show about Visenya. Well, I've, it's a difficult. It's one difficult because it. you have so many strong no, no, no. characters. But. but my problem again is, is you go back to Magor, so you can't have him. So you have you have to show his victims and the people who opposed him more than Magor. Um, I mean, he, it would be an interesting idea to have this show where you have this looming threat sort of that is overshadowing everyone and it's well, about kind their... of like Game of Thrones with the... <laughs> well yes, yes but it, here's that he's a more personal yes. in that sense but and it's uh, about their lives in the shadow of Magor so you'd want a really strong personality playing that someone who could when they're on camera they own the mm. camera someone and they have to be able to be terrifying mm. and monstrous and then, you know, it, it I mean, he's, he's really bad. So there's nothing so, likable about him. He's not I mean, supposed you, you, to be you politically... Can respect, ca- yes, you can respect not... the fact that he's a great warrior, yeah. and he's a great commander, and but he's he's uh, re- uh, you know, relentless. But he doesn't seem to be but charismatic or anything like that. He just, not in, he just seems to have ruled and made cur- well, through he, fear and brute force. Yeah. Uh, I mean, he already impressed people. He was... You know, the, Bill, a big, strong, yeah. powerful guy, a great fighter. So, I mean, he has that kind of... You fear him, though. Yeah. I don't know. I I, I, I could see it. And I, I could mean, definitely see the fact that George is publishing it yeah. in the Book of Swords. And that he's coming out Fire and Blood uh, next year. Which he, again, as we no- noted, he noted this with tags, HBO Game of Thrones. Yeah. It's mm-hmm. clear some sort of Targaryen reign is one of the one or more of the pitches. So... This one stands out as a very, even, but George himself has said, there's a lot of material here that you can make a story out of. There's a lot of characters, there's a lot of interesting characters who oppose him. Um, his nephew, niece, the niece eventually ends up being forced to marry him. Um, his his grandnephew, who becomes Jairus the Old King. Uh, various other individuals uh, on, on the side of the faith uh, in Old Town. Uh, elsewhere, who could be really fascinating. And of course, you have all these women, all the women that he marries, and and some of them are happier, and some of them are less happy about it. Uh, some you have the uh, you have a sorceress, uh, and mm-hmm. th- that one where you know where you again see his brutality, where he tortures her to death in the most just you know just detailed yeah. gruesome way. It it is it is a very dark, but it has a lot of potential. Now, the previous section ran on for quite a while, and the risk is that this one will as well, because it is the Dance of the Dragons. Uh, it is one of our favorite ideas, I would say, one yeah. that we think has a lot of potential. There are problems with it as well, but there's a lot of potential. Now, uh, a lot of the material has been published already. There is, of course, in the World of Ice and Fire, a section heavily edited. There are other versions of the account in... Uh, uh, the rogue prince and the princess and the queen. So the broad strokes of it are, are out there for people to, to look at now. And obviously the, it will be in the first version of Fire and Blood, uh, Volume 1 of Fire and Blood as well. Um, it is a massive account. Uh, 60,000 words or something. Uh, there's a, a lot of characters. Uh, but it is a fascinating, uh, decisive account with two distinct sides a lot of people on each side who are uh, more or less likable or more or less loathsome. Uh, some very likable people who just get caught up in it. So I think it has a lot of potential. 
Yeah, um, the waning days of the reign of Viserys the First, that feels like where you have to kind of start. I don't know how soon you jump into the conflict because soon as soon as Viserys, Viserys dies, um, his younger son or his son Aegon seizes power uh, and prompted by his uh, grandfather and his mother and Chris, Sir Kristen Cole, the kingmaker. Um, maybe you want to set up more, you go further back. I, I don't know. I mean, the, the beginning of it is a bit where I keep trying to figure I don't quite know how you start no. the beginning. That's a tough one. And some because writer there's a lot of stuff that sets but at least, it up. Yeah, because you have the conflict between the, the greens and the blacks mm -hmm. and the fact that as a child, from a childhood, Rhaenyra was going to be, was heir. I mean, Viserys even had his lords come to King's Landing to swear to her. Um, and she was known as the darling of the realm. The darling, you know. yeah, the realm. So you have all this stuff going on and you have, you know, she, she gets married to, to Laner Valorian, uh, but her her children, while she's married, are very clearly not his because he wasn't interested. It was, he was gay. Um, and then he gets murdered, and then she ends up getting married to her uncle, Prince David, who's a, I mean, he's one of the reasons the Death Dragon sounds so amazing, because he is, he's like, he's a Targaryen version of Oberyn Martell to some degree. Yeah, he is, much. he is, he was a wonder, and not a nice man, but uh, a complicated figure who was really interesting. Uh, and you have, you know, you have all the other characters, but... A, you have a you have a surfeit of characters almost. How do you trim it down? I mean, you have to keep Aegon and his wife and sister. You have to keep Aemon one eye. You have to. You really should keep Daeron, his youngest brother. You need his mother. His and mother, his his, uh, his grandfather, grandfather Kristen Cole. So that's there's feeling like you're about full of the court. Whatever mushroom is ever floating around, he's mostly in Dragonstone, though, so that's, that's okay. But you have all that. Then on that side, you've got. Rhaenyra and Daemon and her children by Laenor, actually the children of uh, Crack Crackbones, or uh, who was the uh, uh, strong, who was a great great knight, famous knight of, of of the Riverlands, who is her lover. After it's very complicated, actually. The the this text on what how the, the her love life is very complicated because you yeah. have Mushroom with one story and Eustace. Except the Eustace with another they're, they're story. They're supposed to have been some... Very complex. I mean, Kristen Cole, for example, is supposed to have, have been, been... her lover, or, or maybe uh, not. Uh, maybe he rejected her because he was yes. a true knight. And then she ran off to Damon. And he took the other side. And, and then, of course, if you're having Laenor, you need Laenor's father. The Corlys Valorian and, and his wife, Rhaenys, the queen who, who never, never was. Who is an awesome character, so you need her. Um, it's a lot of people. It's a lot of people. <laughs> now, they just doesn't even go into some of the, you know, Hightower and Casterly Rock, and uh, the North. You got King and Stark. It's a lot of people now. the uh, The big complaints we people get is oh, it's going to be so expensive because there were so many dragons. Mm -hmm. There were a lot of dragons. Seventeen, I think. Yeah, and, and mm -hmm. uh, now my I have an answer to this, which is you generally never had more than like three of them involved in any one battle. Uh, so that, at least, There were very few dragon-on-dragon dragon battles. Yeah, there were, uh, there were a couple, but they were not that um, significant. The most significant was probably um, at uh, Tumbleton. Tumbleton. Yeah, second, mm. second Tumbleton. When, mm. I believe it was second Yeah, second Tumbleton, where it's a big mess. And uh, you had, I think, three dragons at one point actually locked in battle with one another. Yeah. Uh, but that that's it. You never really get more than three at a time. Except the story of Dragon Pit, you got four dragons chained up with hundreds or thousands of people. This riot. Rioters breaking into the Dragon Pit to murder them. And they're chained up. They can't fight back. And they're young. They kill a lot of people. Dozens are killed. But still. So that's a lot of stuff. And then you have Close Syrax. interaction with right. the dragons. And exactly. Those, yeah. And you have Syrax, Rhaenyra's dragon, bursting into the Dragon Pit. Burning everything. Uh, some accounts say that she killed hundreds, but they managed to bring her down just in her fanaticism. Um, other accounts say that basically just by bringing down the dragon pit upon her, it killed her. Either way, she died. You've got you have to kind of have this because Rhaenyra's son Joffrey um, trying to save his dragon Taraxis, a young dragon that was in the dragon pit, jumped on Syrax and tried to get her to fly him over there. 
Uh, but you don't do that. Dragons have a rider. They don't. You can't borrow them. And he ends up falling to his death. Um, where his body's later recovered by some knights of a king's guard. It, I mean, it's interesting because it's one of the situations also that show that the dragons seem to have some sort of um, concern for each other. Because uh, he, mm-hmm. as I said, Cer- was gonna go to the dragon yeah, pit regardless, mm-hmm. and. Uh, yeah, so at least second Tumbleton is another instance there where one dragon seems to be ganging up with another. Uh, it, that one was unclear. I mean, yeah. there, it, it's a mystery to even in Westeros how, what motivates dragons at yeah. times. Um, did a dragon jump in just because of the smell of fighting and blood? It was it fighting, attacking both of them this wildly? Yeah. Was it like a feeding frenzy? You know, yeah. the idea that sharks will bite one another in a feeding frenzy. Yeah. And maybe. Um, but anyways, the dragons are something that I think for the most part you can work around. The battles, there's very few of the major battles have the major characters. So you can kind of cut out a lot of them, I think, or, or prune them down. Yeah, there's um, a couple of key ones that are going to be difficult. Uh, like the battle beneath the God's Eye where Kristen Cole is defeated and uh, executed. That that is one where you don't have to show the whole thing. You don't have to ho- show the whole campaign uh, with the Western lords and their uh, Lord Lannister uh, fighting and struggling. Uh, you don't have to show the whole thing. Now the battle above the God's Eye on the other the, hand. Yeah, the above the God's Eye, you have to show that one. That's where <laughs> Prince Damon ends up dueling in the air uh, against Aemon One Eye, who would be his nephew. His nephew. It's awkward. It gets awkward trying to keep track of all the family yes. bush. Uh, and that, you know, it's, it's, you know, this is an amazing cinematic yeah. moment when he, this, you know, great warrior, yeah. older guy in his 50s, I think, by this yeah. stage, you know, uh, unchanged. So one of the things that, and I know we don't do it on the show, <laughs> but they have these harnesses and saddles and they chain themselves so that if the dragon decides to twist and turn, yeah. they're, they're they're chained in place so they won't fall off he unhooks the chains yeah. and he literally brings his dragon right up against well aren't the dragons already locked they're locked he yeah. unchains and yeah. he leaps and he shoves uh, he shoves dark sister through yeah. Aemon and, and then they fall to her death they fall into the the uh, the god's eye and the bones are eventually drenched up of dragons but Damon's body is never recovered I mean you have other figures I mean let's just talk about women I mean you have so many women you have Rhaenyra of course who has to be yeah. a central figure um, Nettles is the one who came to mind. Nettles is one of yeah. the dragon seed who ends up riding the, the cannibal. No. No, the cannibal. Cheap Stealer. The cannibal is another one. Cheap Stealer. Sorry. Um, and so that's a fascinating figure. You've yeah. got um, Adam of Hull. Adam Valorian, who ends You're up being a female female characters. Well, sorry, but because <laughs> yes, female characters. Uh, you obviously have uh, Queen Alicent, the other, the great rival to Rhaenyra, uh, Viserys' late you know, queen. Who is the one who insists on that her son inherit? Um, Helena. Helena, his sister, a less significant yeah. figure, although she is involved in one of the more gruesome episodes. One of gruesome episodes in in, in the war with blood and cheese. Uh, it is it is full of incident. It is full of interesting characters. I think you can work around to some degree. I think you have to show like at least one great battle a season or something. And I don't know how many seasons it runs. One of the things that appeals to me by by the way is you have a pretty clear end in that the, the war ends. Rhaenyra is dead. Aegon is dead. Everyone kind of agrees. Let's, this is, we've got to finish this. Let's make Rhaenyra's son, Aegon III, king. But at the same time, you had the potential, like, if this show is really popular, people love it. The Regency after it of Aegon. Lots of fun. Lots of fun. Lots of politics. Lots of intrigue. Mm-hmm. Like, more women. Yeah. Uh, Damon's daughters. By Lan Rey now. Yes. yes. You know, these... these. There's a lot of really The, the return of Aegon's brother, Viserys, and his wife. Yes. That's another... I mean, there's, there's a lot <laughs> of really great yeah. things that you could make out of it. It could run a lot of seasons... And if it takes off, if it's popular as well, if it holds the interest, I mean, no one can expect it to be as big as Game of Thrones. No. Like it, Game of Thrones is hitting a sort of critical capacity where it can't get, surely well, it's cannot still get. Still growing. It's still it's growing. A group, but I think you're. I mean, I think with this penultimate season, 
And certainly, it's, I'm guessing the final, final episode is going to draw us a ridiculous number because even people who haven't watched, it will be such a big event that they'll feel like, I'm going to watch this final thing yeah. and they won't understand any of it. But they'll watch it. It happens. Like, it's like when MASH finished. There's a huge But numbers. are you even you going to watch? Uh, no, <laughs> I have no intention of watching. But, um, but at least I would understand, I think. Probably. Yeah. Maybe. Uh, I don't know what they're doing. But anyways, but that said... It has a lot of potential, it's huge, it's epic, it's got blood, it's got sex, it's got violence, it's got intrigue, it's got... Dragons. It has uh, dragons, but it has all the things that you kind of think of Game of Thrones, but more. But at the same time, I think a good writers can get around the most expensive aspects of it, for the most part, and make it, I mean, to be like, what should be the most expensive single thing they do is the storming of dragon pit like mm -hmm. that could be at the midpoint of the dance of the dragons part of the story and be this huge catastrophic thing yeah i mean you kind of you know it would feel like a big like a turning point um but that's just that's just by thinking about it i think it could work i really think it could work now the other side of it is maybe it's almost like well most of these characters aren't really very likable. Rhaenyra was not a particularly likable figure. Damon, I mean Damon is attractive. I think he's yeah. a very Oberyn esque figure, and Oberyn has his fans. Yeah. Um, but maybe he says being complete. Oh, he has his fans. Yeah. A few. Yeah, a few. So I think <laughs> you can definitely, and in particular on the other side, you have the problem of. Alison, Alison, and her her father Otto look very graspy. So they're definitely it's yes. gonna be hard to paint them as more uh, as in being a equivalent. No. I think the main thing you'd have to focus on is the idea is look, this guy has they maintain stability in the realm. Why shouldn't they continue? Mm. I mean, Rhaenyra has shown herself to be a bit spoiled, a bit capricious. Damon has definitely showed himself to be uh, very bloody minded. Um, and these people might, it's a sort of same sort of thing like Littlefinger says to Ned, you know, if you put Stannis on the throne, even if it's his by right, there will be blood. Yeah. The Tyrrells and, and, and Lannisters will not stand for him as king. Yeah. So you could kind of, you could kind of see a conflict, but I think the natural sympathies will have to end up falling over Nera, um, yeah. because she has all these young children. I mean, the only really, on Aegon's side, the only really likable figure is like Daeron Daring, who is his younger brother, who is, you know, said to be you know, young, bold, but kind of gentle hearted, uh, really good intentioned. He's just fighting for his family. Um, but, but you have so many but figures Aegon on your and side. and one eye are not nice people. No. Um, so you have a lot of really cool things. Uh, and I think it could work. I really think it could. You have, and, and you have a lot of room for shaping themes and ideas and complicating the story. Whether you whether you would play a bit with the different chroniclers standing around and, and being par participants, Septon Eustace on one side, Mushroom on the other, uh, Grand Maester or Wild, you have a lot of really interesting things that I I think that I would love to see on on the screen if it's done well. Yeah, my big concern would be that they would try to change someone like Rhaenyra to make her more likable, um, just to have a sort of stronger appeal. I mean. I have that issue with the show in that they did that with Cersei. Yeah. At least uh, initially. Now, whatever. But uh, <laughs> uh, I wouldn't think that's quite right. I mean, I I don't think that Rhaenyra is not an evil person. No, she wasn't evil. She is. Uh, it's her right. She yeah. is. It, it is her right. Um, I mean, her father decided to go against what had been done before and. Uh, for those who don't know, the reason is because yeah. for a long time he didn't have a son, so he basically insisted, my daughter will follow me, and then, and then suddenly he had sons, um, but he never changed his mind. No, even though there had been a precedent that went against a female ruler, yeah. uh, that's why uh, Cordis Valarian's wife, Rhaenys, is called the queen who never was, because she was passed she over. Was passed over. Um, so there is a, against the idea of there is something against the idea of a queen, but uh, a ruling queen. Uh, but you know she she's she feels a little, a little bit entitled, a bit spoiled, 
uh, she is not a good ruler by any means. She's too weak. Uh, I think. She, As in, she she has uh, um, personal weaknesses. Not not that she's a uh, not like Anus weak, she, she, but she she's, has she, she's short tempered and, and she's uh, you know. But I mean, the battle plan works out pretty well for the most part for I mean, yeah. a lot of the time, but. Uh, yes, in peacetime, I don't think. And a lot of the picture we get, of course, is also you know, Septon Eustace puts a spade yeah. on her. Oh, but she cut herself on the Iron Throne, mm-hmm. and she, uh, he's re- distinctly, we know which camp he's in. Yeah. Um, so that's a big part of it. Uh, I true think history, and, uh, obviously. That's the other part. So as it as, you can obviously, because you have just sixty thousand words mm-hmm. instead of the hundreds and hundreds of thousands of mm-hmm. fire, and because some of those 60,000 60, words, I mean. All 60,000 words are written by Gildane, drawing from various sources. He was not a witness. He was not personally there. So one of the fun things writers can do, and one of the things that make me much more interested in seeing something like this than seeing Robert's Rebellion, is the fact that there's so much openness in terms of interpreting this event. The the writers can say, well, this is just our version of the story. Mm. We've pieced together what we consider a canonical version. It's not necessarily the version. No. Um, but we'll just hope that it is an appealing version appeal. of what yeah, it's done because exactly. then there are ways that you could do it that wouldn't be as fun and that wouldn't feel as right. But I think it has a lot of potential and I, I would certainly... There's a lot of the other ideas that I would like to see as well, but this one is definitely one of my favorites. Right. Uh, I had the Regency, but I we already discussed that as being a continuation, mm-hmm. possibly. It could be done on its own, but I feel it'd be really weird. It would be weird. To kind of just jump in and say, oh, yeah. by the way, there was this huge war, and now we're starting this kid. <laughs> yeah. But there's a, there's a lot of interesting figures. So um, we'll jump ahead to another period that George was quite interested in. Aegon IV uh, and his merry mistresses. Uh this is a period, lots of women, of course. Uh, um, and years ago, George shared, uh, we were in Glasgow for the World Con, and I recall yeah. we were having breakfast, and fans were gathered of George. Uh, and we were asking, if, I think he had mentioned it before, so we were, so we were getting a follow-up. But basically, he had said, he had a couple ideas, and one was like a murder mystery set in Brawl, which I think mm. we discussed last episode, yeah. briefly. And the other was... A kind of Flashman esque George McDonald Frazier's Flashman um, story of Aegon the Fourth, kind of told uh, kind of told from his perspe- perspective, where you know George said he was like the worst king the Seven Kingdoms ever had, and a, a lot of people hate that one. Oh, the Mad King was surely worse, but no, George. I mean, George was aware of the Mad King when he said this, and he. Yeah. That, and I, think, I think and Magor was true, but I think the the difference between them, and I think it's like his meaning there was that Aegon purposefully misruled he ruled to please himself to to mess with people just because he could um he was not a person who ruled badly because he was stupid or uh, insane or cruel he ruled badly because he wanted to rule badly and that's what makes him the worst i mean like you take uh, some of the aspects of Robert, I don't want to be a responsible king. Uh, although he, Aegon wanted to be king, I think, once he realized what powers it, it gave him. And, and then you have Maegor's, you know, let's go through all the women, although he, he wasn't going through a bunch of yeah. wives, he was just going through mistresses. Uh, not by any means as cruel as Magor, as in, in the no. mur- murdering people to left and right. He killed, killed the one mistress because yeah. she, you know, he got her in bed with the king's guard. Yeah, which is yeah. reasonable enough, I suppose. I, I mean, I mean, I mean, it's probably treason of some kind. Yeah, but um, so you have a lot of fascinating figures in this period. You got Viserys, his father. So you may, if you show him, Viserys the second, who is the uh, uh, yes, who is the brother of Aegon the third, who is a really interesting figure. Um, you have Aemon of Dragon Knight, you have Aegon's wife and sister, Nerys. Uh, you could lead up to, I mean, at a time period, you've got um, Diana the Defiant, who is the mother of Damon Blackfire, who becomes this figure who leads the first of these major rebellions, um, on the, Black, the Blackfire Rebellions. Yeah. His relations with all these mistresses, the Black Pearl from mm-hmm. Bravos, and, and all these figures, there's really, it, it, you could do it, and he's much more of a Tony Soprano-like 
figure. Immoral. I mean, immoral, he's, he's, he's vastly, immoral, vastly immoral. He's an immoral person, but, you know, he had his charm. I mean, he was like, you know, George obviously was inspired by Henry Tudor here as well. Um, but he had his charm. He was he was a good-looking, fit sportsman, but not the knight that his his brother was. Um, Until he got old and fat and full of And then he became old and fat and full of... <laughs> The pox, um, but so George, but George thought about it, made it very appealing. Now, of course, on the Live Journal, I think someone asked him about it, and he said, "He said he, he made two pitches. One of them, which HBO said, okay, let's go and look at that, and the other one, they said no." And so someone asked him, "Well, was it either of these ideas, the murder mystery in Bravos, or a, a sort of egg in the fourth? And George said, "No, um, he did not pitch either of those." Hmm. I I. I mean, I lost. Yeah, unless, but, he, unless he meant that he didn't pitch Egan as a sort of the Flashman esque. Uh, no, uh, maybe uh, maybe if he was being. I think he is, he didn't pitch it. I think he probably yeah. has other ideas of, and, and I think this one will feel quite different from Game of Thrones in some ways because mm. it's much more of a court uh, intriguing and breeze again <laughs> snoring away. Uh, um, but. There's like no real battles other than his like real well, unless you go back further to like Deir and the Young Dragon. I skipped that. I mean, mm-hmm. and you got interesting people in this period as well, Baylor and, and the sisters, yeah. Diana and the, them. The but... problem is that if you go back to Daeron, you then and you, you sort of you'd have to then fast forward through Baylor. We don't have to fast forward, but you probably have to kind of. You, I mean, yeah, you, yeah, because it's a bit of a problem that we run into on our own. The role playing game a little bit. Run. It's a we, very different. We started with Aaron's conquest. It's like and... if the High Sparrow had won and <laughs> ran everything for a decade. Uh, but I mean, Baylor was a was. You could do stuff with you it, but, stuff, it, but, it, but it's a quieter it. period. There's not really any. George doesn't describe any big wars mm. or battles. We we come up with stuff on our game. Of smaller things that you could see as incidents that would have happened that weren't necessarily. And it's gonna put a cramp in the sex. A little bit. Egan certainly found a, dif- a difficult time period. <sighs> yeah, it was so bad. He had to sleep with his own wife. Yeah, he was not too happy about that. Um, that said, so let's forget it. I I, I skipped that because I, I yeah. feel like it. It doesn't quite feel like what someone would, oh. would pitch. And again, it has like a lot of Dorn, which I don't know. I think they, from what I, I don't they think they the ever want to go to Dorn again, though. Um, but so if George didn't pitch. It doesn't mean another writer didn't hit on it. I mean, the material is there. The Egan section is one of the more fleshed out, and because the mistresses are put in their historical context, like the, what's happening, and there's more detail. Uh, so and there's various stories about it. So I, I think. I think it's a possibility. Then again, it could feel very Tudors. So it could feel very Tudors. It could and feel very different. And I, maybe the important thing is they want to capture something that feels very Game of Thrones. Mm. Which the next one maybe does or does it. So the Black Fire Rebellion is uh, one of the final ideas that we're looking at. And we're not really sure this one works. A lot of people have brought it up. And it certainly has a lot of attractive features. It has, you know, the, the first Blackfire Rebellion has a lot of um, splendid heroes and some uh, fascinating development with, you know, when Damon Blackfire, in the wake of the chaos that Aegon the Unworthy has caused by uh, legitimizing all of his bastards and giving his sword, Blackfire, to Damon. Um, and people around him kind of say, well, you know, you should be king because uh, Aegon's legitimate son, Daeron, is kind of uninspiring, plus he's all too friendly with Dorne. Yeah. So uh, it has a potential, and it's got all these legendary knights, but it feels like it'd be a little thin, maybe. Yeah. I mean, you got, yeah, you have some strong figures, and mm. Damon's very, uh, George kind of described him as looking a bit like uh, Marvel comic Thor. Um, you know, tall, fair-haired, broad-shouldered, uh, flat-bellied, strong, the, the greatest warrior who ever lived, according to some. And he was a great warrior, that cannot be doubted. Um, 
you got Blood Raven and Bittersteel, his half brothers, who are great rivals to one another, taking different sides. Yeah. It is a. But the the thing that sticks out to me is women. Women are not a big part of that story. Mm-hmm. I mean, sure, you got Darren's queen, uh, who the daughter's princess Mariah, and you've got. Share a sea star, I guess, somewhere floating around. That's Blood Raven's lover. Yeah. Um, you have who's the other one I said we had? Um, the Prince of Dorne's Targaryen bride, Daenerys. Mm-hmm. Um, but the Prince of Dorne kind of gets involved late in the fighting. And again, do we really want to involve Dorne? And they're, 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 you wouldn't focus on them at all. No. So. Uh, yes, Damon is married and he's had a bunch of kids by uh, Rohane of, or, uh, of Tyrosh, but she's she's like a non-figure almost no. entirely. So it feels to me not very Game of Thrones um, in a lot of ways. You have this Hotspur Percy type figure, which is what Damon kind of... Well, well, actually Fireball is more Hotspur. I mean, Damon is also kind of Hotspur. It's <laughs> actually kind of funny that way. Um... You've got a lot of interesting stuff, but I, I just, I just don't yeah. think it feels very martial. It feels, it feels very, very martial, like yeah. it's a lot about battles and not so much about intrigues. Yeah, you could lead up to um, Damon. I mean, there's a big, I guess the big question mark is, did Damon Black fire rebel for good or bad reasons? Uh, I, I will take the very clear position, I think, for very, many very bad reasons. I think... His head got filled with nonsense by various figures. Um, and Darren, his half-brother, treated him very well. Now, all the evidence says he treated him really well. But, I mean, he, he the wife that his, you know, was arranged for him, he went through with that. He treated, I mean, he, he was not denied the court or anything. But people just basically who didn't like him because his his Dornish wife and by the fact that he brought Dorn into the realm and, and was and really... And wasn't much of a warrior. Wasn't much of a warrior. People who had these stupid biases basically went against him um, and went and, and poured poison to Damon's ear. So Damon could have been a great guy, um, but he was... he His, his ego, his hubris was his weak point and it was exploited and a great deal of trouble came out of it and obviously you have to go back to a in the fourth and blame him of course for yes starting all that nonsense mm-hmm. putting around the idea that Darren was not legitimate for example out of yeah. peak out of peak because mind he, you know what's gonna happen when your father is Aegon the unworthy and your mother is Dana the defiant you might come out a little yeah. rebellious uh, <laughs> and, uh, okay uh, obviously the uh, another figure that we've we ought to have at this point is the Princess Elena, who's an interesting figure. So that's yes. one more woman yeah. you kind of have as an older advisor and uh, supporter. But Because um, Raina is a septa by this time, I think. Raina is a septa and Dana's Diana has died yeah. at, by this point. So I don't know. I, 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 I find it hard to feel like... Like one of my favorite pieces of art from the world by Sapphire is the depiction of the... the uh, red grass field. The red grass field. Uh, with Damon and, and Bittersteel leading the charge, it's I I'd love to see that kind of thing. At the same time, I just, I just don't know. But I it'd be more just, like a movie. It'd be more like a movie. movie. I don't know. But I feel like no. I could really be taken by a, a series no. about this. A movie about the Blackfire Rebellion and sort of focusing on the red grass field. Yeah, yeah. I'd like to see that. But uh, no, I don't. All think right. Work uh, well. One more, and we'll kind of wrap it up. I think this has gone a lot longer than we thought it would go. <laughs> one um is a bit oddball i guess um but it's it's like when you go from the black fire rebellion you know you're not doing duncan egg so you're going through these various reigns and you think it you know egg in the fifth could that and he has his sons and there's definitely stories there but i just i just find it very hard very hard but there is a story in the later Targaryen reign that does have women featured pretty prominently, 
which has intrigue, which has some fighting, which has a smaller scope than all of these. Mm. And that is, well, kind of the rise of Tywin Lannister. So this is a weird one. Like, first off, it's not... Targaryens are ancillary characters on the edges, you know. Um, but Tywin, when George... I mean, we have the bones of it in the novels. And the world of Ice and Fire has fleshed it out a lot more. George then published uh, what he wrote for the Western Lands on his website. And basically, you have Lord Titus, for various reasons, he's, he's the youngest son, just wanted to please people, very, very weak ruler. Everyone took advantage of him. But you have, he has a son, Tywin, and Tywin is a tough little kid, <laughs> even from childhood, you know. You kind of have to show that bit, right? With, uh... Yeah, like when, when Gena is married off to... Afray. Afray, and like the old, like, you know, the red lion storms out. <laughs> And Tywin like stands up in front of all these people, and denounces it yeah. to his father's face. Like He's like ten you know, or something. Nine, eleven. I can't remember. The, I know there was a, bit, oh, a question mark on the age, but um, but more importantly, he he becomes a squire. He becomes you know in time uh, at King's Landing. He comes back as an, a knight. He ends up taking care of business. So you have uh, women. You definitely have scope for women. You have Joanna, Tywin eventually marries. Uh, you have. Uh, the great rivals, kind of Ellen Rain, later Ellen Tarbeck, and you have uh, Jane Marbrand. Uh, so you have a lot of scope for some interesting stuff that you can kind of, if you cover a period of time. And I mean, Charles Dance was just a kind of magnetic figure, yeah. such a popular figure. He was so perfect to play Tywin. I, I'm not, they didn't do it exactly how I hoped yeah. for, but it pretty yeah. good translation. I think someone could see. When they read the Royal Fire, they read that Western Lands. They say, "Hey, there's a story here. It kind of connects to figures we know." Now, is he a continue? He's not a continuing figure. He's not a current figure. Is he an existing figure from uh, from what they said after Casey and Royce? I don't know. Um, I could see a story. I could yeah. see a story, and you got um, the Tarbex rebelling. You have yeah. the Reigns rebelling. The big problem for me there is that they did the fall of Castamere completely differently on the show, other than the retelling of it, uh, not at all as cool as uh, drowning no. everyone in their well, Also, you also have, minds. obviously, one of the incidents is when he's a young knight, uh, and he ends up becoming friends of various figures who are parents of various people. You've mm -hmm. got, um, in particularly, you have um, Aerys, whom he knights, mm -hmm. is there. Um, Brendan uh, Tully becomes famous as a young yeah. squire uh, in the fighting there. Uh, Barris and Selmy as a young man, as a great hero. So you could have a whole thing where he ends up being called to war, being involved in that fighting. When he comes back, things have gotten even worse in the Westerners. He, he deals with things in his particular way. <laughs> yeah. They can, I mean, I know, but they kind of, um, changed the Casimir thing. Yeah. But they, they could, they could just, Cersei's bad at history. Because what George, what he actually does is a lot more interesting and a lot more ruthless. Yeah. Um, so a young Tywin story, I could kind of see it. I, I don't yeah. know if anyone would think about it, but... And, My and problem is that it comes too close to... Uh, it feels like it has such a distinct end point in that all the others, um, they're a little further back. So people can kind of feel that, uh, yeah, but we don't know exactly what happens to these characters. With Tywin, you know what happens to Tywin. So it may loom too much over it at this point. Maybe further down the line you could do it. I also don't know how many seasons you could do with something like that. But right now I think people will be too much. Well, we are just watching this uh, show about a guy that we know is dead. Historical fiction is um, historical TV shows are all like that. People, yeah. I don't know if that matters yeah, so much. It, if it's well, done when you, well, when you've seen him die recently, it's a story that's been completely kind of untold by a TV show, and mm -hmm. like it's a story that is interesting. So, and you could lead up to you know you could probably finish. I don't know when you would finish it. Like, would you go all the way to his becoming Hand? Probably would that be a good stopping point? He's very young when he becomes Hand of a King. Uh, or do you go to the first years of Aerys' reign? Do you go to the birth of Jaime and Cersei and maybe end it mm. there? I think the natural stopping point is uh, probably uh, Robert's Rebellion, and then you, they're not doing that for sure. But, well, that goes... Mm. It, you're covering a lot of time. I mean, you can. Yeah. You can. Um, it just feels like you get an unfinished story. Yeah. It doesn't make sense. Obviously, all of this, some of these things could... Uh, 
kind of maybe if you did a treated more an anthology show mm-hmm. where and this is one of the things people have pitched where you do a season, different cast, different mm-hmm. things, and you could even cover Taiwan that way. But I don't know. I, I'm not sure I, how, how attached people get to characters in those. If it's the same as I mean, Fargo has been doing it to success. Mm-hmm. Uh, American Horror Story has done it as well. Uh, my understanding, I've never actually yeah. watched it. No, I mean, no. But but and you certainly have the possible the potential in the sense that well, you could get great actors each season for one season. Yeah, that's uh, easier and, and it's easier and it's cheaper yeah. instead of having. I mean, all the casts have become very expensive it's, because they're running yeah. eight years. Yeah, it, it costs a lot. You want to kill them off faster. So if you could jump around, you could. Yeah, you're paying a higher fee for that one year because. But it's like Sean Bean, like when they got him. Mm. So you could you could see that as appealing. His, histories of Westeros. Or... Histories of Westeros. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I there's a lot of potential. I I'll be very interested if we ever get. Some sort of reveal of what these various pitches are. I mean, uh, just to yeah. bring it back into the Benioff and Weiss mm-hmm. world for a second. I mean, they announced Confederate, a lot of drama and, and protests and, <laughs> and, and stuff online about that one. Uh, just the other day, Amazon revealed that they are working on a similar alt history show inspired by the events of a civil war. In this case, the civil war is won, but after the reconstruction, uh, by, by the North, rather, after the reconstruction, the North actually takes three sovereign states and make and gives them to the freed former slaves and says this is your own country now okay. you guys as a reparation are, are we on, what tangent are we on now though? well the tangent <laughs> i was gonna make here is that this was a show that amazon bought uh they just announced like who the creators were mm-hmm. and basically gave no information oh. a year ago and okay. they had an intended to announce it. so it's a long process no, no they've been working on developing this for yeah. over a year and they felt forced to kind of bring it up now, but Confederate got announced. So it wouldn't look like they had uh, yeah. just copied the idea. Because so, I think it's like the announcement exists a year ago, but they had bought something, mm. but it only now have revealed this is what they were developing. Yeah. So the whole point I was going to bring it up, up was the fact that um, it's such a long timeline for developing yeah. things. Um, we have no idea when, yeah. if anything's going to surface. Uh, obviously, since they have gone out and said we are looking at five pitches, at some four, point, four pitches, and George says that a fifth is getting is yeah, involved. Okay, he right. keeps mentioning it, so I, I think it's happened. Uh, but right, HBO has only said four, so we'll confirm. I think even I think it only confirmed yeah. four, so I think the deals for the fifth was still being right. Out, but I at guess. some point, they probably have to go and say we didn't pick any of them up. If, if, that, if that's the yeah. case, if they don't pick any of them up, at some point they're going to have to say that. I would guess next year's TCAs, they're probably, if they haven't announced anything themselves, they'll probably be asked about it. They may say, oh, you know, we dropped some of them, mm. or we're now just focused on just one of them, and yeah. we're not certain yet, we're going to get the scripts for it, mm. I don't know. The one thing I'll say, if show, showrunner to be, if you happen to have decided to watch this, because you're, you're kind of amused by what, for whatever reason, what we think about it. Uh, about what you should be doing. The only thing I would ask you, the, the, it's the thing that maybe someday I'll, I'll do something on when I l- look back on Game of Thrones and why I was so unhappy with it. Have a real writer's room. Look, don't do the show running, the heavy lifting of producing, uh, editing, this this full thing that Benioff and Weiss did. Don't do the auteur thing where you want full control and you want to write almost every script and you have a heavy hand on every show. Uh, look at some of the other people out there, other models of doing it. Have a real writer's room with multiple writers. Mm-hmm. You could you could co-write all the scripts um, like Matt uh, Wainer did on Mad Men. You could uh, do more of a Deadwood approach. You could do more of a Sopranos approach. But have a lot of writers you can work with so that you do not get stretched too thin. I feel that that's probably the biggest problem that came to Game of Thrones was too few points of view in that writer's room uh, and two people who had far too much say in the writer's room so that they that bad decisions could not get headed off. Plus How who we, apparently wore themselves out and now they want out as quickly from the as third, possible. From the third season, we had people telling us they, they're so tired. Yeah. You know, so and I'm, I'm, I'm talking about people who had direct interaction and contact with them that they were really exhausted by what they were doing. Um, yeah, and, they, it's, and these are young guys. Yeah. I mean, know. they look a little bit like what happens when somebody becomes president, right? Yes. Look at <laughs> it's <laughs> they too, get all gray and tight. It's too much. I mean, 
like okay, JMS, J. Michael Straczynski kind of did the same thing, but he had a, he especially there was a season where he wrote pretty much every episode, and that's twenty odd episodes uh, to varying levels levels of success. Uh, but it was a very different thing, a very different level. I mean, they were turning on an episode every 10 days or something like that. So it's a very different production. I think if you're going to do something like Game of Thrones, have other writers. I it's, it's my plea. It's my hope. If I find out that the show's announced and it's a showrunner and like two handpicked writers and that's it, I'm going to be very, very concerned. Have more people, please.